Hello, everyone. Welcome to part two of the uh, skeletal system lab. Uh, in this lab, we are going to be focusing on what's left of our axial skeleton, uh, specifically discussing the sacrum coccyx, uh, thoracic cage, ribs, etc. And then we're going to look at the upper extremity bones. Um, and in uh, this, we're going to begin with our sacrum and coccyx. Now, as I get started, what we're going to do, we're going to look at the model I have here of the sacrum and coccyx combined, where I have my sacrum sacrum here and ending right there and then we have the coccyx these multiple small bones that tailbone here you're looking at the sacrum from an anterior view here we're looking at it from the posterior view um, this being the superior surface going down towards the inferior surface to the coccyx being attached to the inferior aspect of that bone now also, what we're going to be looking at here is the structures that we can discern on the sacrum. And the first one we want to talk about is our auricular surface, like the auricle of the ear, sacroiliac joint, which I'm going to supplement with a diagram, uh, superior articular processes. Now, preferably, if you're asking me, it is just articular processes. There are no superior articular processes on the sacrum because there are no in inferior articular processes of the sacrum, but our structure sheets um, say it this way, but I completely disagree with that. Uh, in anatomy, we don't use words we don't need. Uh, the sacral uh, promontory, uh, the sacral canal, median sacral crest, sacral foramina, and sacral hiatus. So let's go find these structures. And let's begin with the auricular surface. The auricular surfaces are found on the lateral sides of the sacrum. Here we're looking at one here. Notice how it looks like an ear, uh, hence auricular surface here. And here, notice how they look like ears. These are going to be what attaches to the ilium, and this is going to form part of the sacroiliac joint, the auricular surfaces. Next, what I want to turn our attention to is the sacroiliac joint. Now, to see the sacroiliac joint, I'm actually going to go down here to next uh, lab's material and talk about the articulation between the ilium of the coxal bones and the sacrum itself. Um, so that is the sacroiliac joint there. The sacroiliac joint will be something I will talk about again later on. I do have an articulated... Um, uh, hip model of the in the lab, but not one that I could easily bring home with me to do videos during COVID. Um, as well, let's talk about the sacral, uh, the superior articular processes, or uh, simply put, articular processes. These are remnants of the superior articular processes that would have been here, but there are no inferiors, so there are only articular processes, and you can see their facets here, that would be articulating with the inferior articular processes and facets of L5 vertebrae. So these are the uh, the articular processes. Now, preferably, I'm going to call them articular processes and not call them superior. Uh, our structure sheets still say that. Um, I'm not the one in charge of those, um, though I make a statement about that every semester. Uh, the sacral promontory. Now, the sacral promontory is a... Um, uh, kind of like if you have something prominent that you want to display at your house, you would put it on a shelf. Notice how this sticks out like a shelf. The sacral promontory is the extension here where L5 vertebrae is going to help articulate, and it sticks out forming a shelf, our sacral promontory. The sacral canal on my model is not very well visible, but I did pick one that had a fused sacrum and coccyx. The sacral canal would be located here where this model is not open because it's solid. It is that it was, this would be open for uh, nerves to enter. The cauda equina and stuff would enter down here. And there will be a hollow tunnel coming out and ending about here near where the uh, coccyx attaches. And where the sacral hiatus actually 
ends, you would find some, I mean, the sacral canal ends, you'll find the sacral hiatus. Now, the median sacral crest, this is actually the ridge down the middle, median down the middle, sacral on the sacrum, crest, a raised ridge. So the median sacral crest is this ridge that runs down the middle, and underneath of that would be the sacral canal. Now, on either side of sacral canal, you will notice there are multiple holes. These smaller holes, plural, holes on each side are called the sacral foramina. And the sacral foramina on each side there, okay, sacral foramina. Now, the sacral hiatus would be right about here. Uh, there is an opening right about here where you have your coccyx attached, and it would be the opening in the sacral canal in the inferior aspect uh, referred to as the sacral hiatus. A hiatus is an opening. You have very many hiatuses, like where the esophagus goes through the diaphragm muscle. We have hiatuses there. You've probably heard of a hiatal hernia. Now, a hiatus uh, is a uh, opening in some kind of structure. Now, the coccyx, as we said, we've already pointed to it. Let's just remind ourselves again of the coccyx. All right, so as we made it through this bone, our next bone that we're going to want to venture through is starting to move towards our thoracic cage, uh, bones of the thorax. So here you can see some nice diagrammatic views of all the things. Now, I do need to remove some like uh, the cornu, things like that, some extra structures that I have not removed. Um, just know that for my classes, the things on these lists are the only structures you need to know is what your structure sheets say. And I do have extra things in the images that I pulled from the textbook. It's just that uh, I want to make sure that you guys know that we have that. Okay, now let's begin with the thorax. Now the thorax, uh, what this is, is a big part of the cage, so to speak, that makes up your chest, involving the sternum, its costal cartilages, and the ribs. Now as we look at the sternum, the first thing we're going to investigate is there's a manubrium, the jugular notch, the body, and the xiphoid process. Now, I want you guys to notice with the jugular notch, right here in the dead center, okay, the jugular notch. Now, we're going to talk about that when we get into uh, the model. Our model has a really good jugular notch. So, here we're looking at the sternum. Now, on the sternum, we have uh, first thing, let's stick in order of our structure sheets, is the manubrium. Now, I always like to say that a sternum looks like a tie. And since it looks like a necktie, something a man should know how to do is tie a tie. Uh, gentlemen, you need to learn how to tie a tie. Uh, when you go into uh, to do your first job interviews, uh, it, it, it says a lot about you as a gentleman, how you tie your tie. So a man should know how to tie a tie. And the knot of the tie that a man ties is the manubrium. And then we have the body of the, tie, of the tie, the body of the sternum, and then the xiphoid process is the tip of the tie. So the three major regions are distinctive portions, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid processes. So the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process, now up here, this is your jugular notch, okay, near and associated to things like the jugular veins. Now, also what we want to turn our attention to is costal cartilages. Now, the costal cartilages on this model are depicted here. These are this kind of yellowish, semi-transparent material that is found here representing cartilages attached to the ribs itself. Now, I'm going to turn it this way so we can try to get more of that in view on the camera I'm using. Now, uh, what I do want to show you guys is these are associated to ribs. Now, there are going to be two major types of rib. Uh, uh, this should say vertebro uh, uh, sternal ribs. Um, and I keep finding that for some reason, things are missing when I do... Uh, um, <clears throat> 
things here like true ribs for te- uh, like here this should be been vertebro sternal here um, and uh, for some reason things keep missing or getting in the wrong place in my notes when I move them around so I do apologize uh, I always sit here and catch it but every time I update things it seems to mess with stuff um, I mean, I've been using these for uh, some version of these notes going through various upgrades and updates for years, and these problems have never been there, so I don't know what's going on. Uh, anyway, the vertebrosternal or true ribs, that's going to be the first seven ribs. Now, if we actually look here, you would see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then there are, so with those seven ribs that you would see there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then there's eight, nine, ten. Now notice there's ten cartilages, but only uh, there, and there's twelve ribs. So if we notice there's twelve ribs, that means two ribs do not have cartilages. Ribs eleven and twelve are floating ribs. So eight, nine, and ten are attached to cartilages. That are considered false ribs. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then these three go to our vertebrochondral ribs. And then the last two would be associated to the floating ribs. Now, on my multiple choice section of my exam, I'm going to ask you guys ribs one through seven are called what? Vertebrosternal or true ribs. False ribs are ribs eight through 12. Eight through 10 of the false ribs are vertebrochondral. Uh, then floating ribs are the vertebral or floating ribs. Uh, and I'm going to ask those kinds of questions on multiple choice. So do know which rib numbers are what. Uh, that is something I'm going to ask you guys on a test. Now, uh, here you could see all these particular things, the vertebrosternal ribs. You could see the ribs articulated with the cartilages, how ribs one through seven are the true ribs. Uh, then uh, the next three, uh, uh, eight, nine, and ten are attached to cartilages, and then 11 and 12 are floating. Now, these floating ribs uh, easily can be broken, uh, a little bit more easily fractured, can oftentimes perforate, uh, rib, broken ribs can perforate lungs, things like that. Uh, so some stuff you'll be looking at on x-rays. Now, the deal is, guys, is um, now as we go into appendicular, we've now left our axial skeleton, and we're now going into the appendicular bones. Remember, there's 126 of those. 126 appendicular. Today, we're going to focus on the pectoral girdle and arms. So that'd be 64 bones. How is it so many? Is it's a two for the price of one uh, deal on these bones, okay? So most of these bones are doubles. Uh, well, all of these bones are doubles. They're all bilateral in nature. So they're all going to be doubles. So we're going to start with the clavicle. Now, clavicle, very easy for us, will be clavicle. Not a lot on the clavicle. First thing, I need you guys to be able to identify a clavicle. Diagrammatically, we can see what a normal clavicle looks like. And I'm going to take the model I have um, and uh, now mine uh, is actually a left clavicle that I have model of. This one's a right on the picture on the screen now. We're going to look at the sternal and acromial end. So as you can see, I, this one is a right. The one I have here is a left clavicle. Uh, this will be a left clavicle with its sternal end and acromial end. Now, on the appendicular skeleton, it is going to be very common that I'm going to have a bone. Now, here's something I'm going to, I'm going to kind of tell my students how I do my exams. I may have this a picture of this bone and say, name the bone. Then I might come in and pick either the acromial end or the flattened sternal end of that bone and have you identify it. So... Uh, be prepared for almost every single appendicular bone, especially the uh, uh, some of the ones I'm going to tell you to be able to identify those specific bones, especially the long bones. You'll have to identify them disarticulated. 
So now that we can do that, let's turn our attention to the scapula. Now, the scapula is one of the most difficult bones that we learn. Um, on uh, this diagram, we are looking at one that is found on the right side of the body. And on the diagram that I'm using, my, my model is a left scapula. Mine is a left. The one on the picture here is a right. So I happen to grab a right model. Uh, the, we're going to look at the scapula. First thing I want to do is always show the bone. This is the scapula. This is actually a left scapula. Uh, this is its superior aspect. This is its inferior aspect. Now we are looking at an anterior surface here. This would be the posterior surface. By the way, this is its medial side, and this is its lateral side, as we can see in Marcate. So what I'm going to do is begin by looking at the different things on it, the acromion. Let's begin with the acromion. Then we'll see the coracoid processes. Uh, coracoid process, not processes. There's only one model I have here. There are two coracoid processes, one on each scapula. Uh, a glenoid fossa or cavity. Uh, the spine of the scapula. We'll look at the borders and the angles and the fossa. So let's begin with the acromion and the coracoid. Now acromion is going to be the really big, big process here. Acromion, then coracoid. Acromion and coracoid process. Coracoid process, acromion. Now, when you say acromion, to help you remember, acromion is very big. Just kind of like, I always like put my, when I teach it in class, I put my hands on my shoulder, on my waist, looking very tough and menacing, and I go, acromion. Very acromion, very authoritative, very acromion, very big and uh, impressive. Acromion, coracoid processes. Now, let's look at the glenoid cavity. Glenoid cavity or fossa. The glenoid fossa or cavity is this structure here where the head of the humerus will actually articulate into. Okay. So this is our chromion here. All right. Now let's turn our attention to the next structure. Let's look at the spine of the scapula. The spine of the scapula, if we find the acromion here and we are turn our attentions to this structure, you're looking at the spine of the scapula. Now the spine separates and marcates two fossa from each other, so we're going to revisit the spine of the scapula momentarily. Okay, We'll kind of revisit that. Now, the borders, we're going to look at the lateral border, medial border, and superior border. Now, as you see the superior border, uh, that's just going to be this edge here. Uh, we're going to be talking about the borders are mostly associated to this major part, excluding these. Okay, So let's look at the first border, the lateral border or axillary border. Now, let's turn it to an anterior aspect. Looking here, here is the glenoid, and under the glenoid, this is what is called the axillary border or the lateral border. Medial border, which goes this way, faces towards the vertebral column, the spinal column, your vertebrae, so we call this the vertebral border as well. Then this portion right here is the superior border. So lateral border, medial border, superior border, forming this one, two, three-sided part of the blade of the scapula, the body of the scapula. The borders, now we have angles. Now the inferior, superior, and lateral angle. The inferior superior angles and the lateral angles are pretty easy to find. Um, so let's go and find those together. So our superior angle, of course, here, find the superior border, and there's an angle form when the superior border comes up. The inferior angle here where the medial and lateral borders meet, and then where the glenoid meets the lateral border, you will find the lateral angle. 
Now, we said that you're going to be using the spine to find the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and uh, fossas. So here we're looking at the anterior surface. Let's turn it to the posterior surface and again find the spine. In the spine of the scapula, we have a pit here on top of it called the supraspinous fossa, supraspinous fossa, where the supraspinatus muscle would be located in uh, supraspinous fossa. And then down here below the spine, there is a fossa called the infraspinous fossa. Supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa. Turn it around to the anterior aspect, and you will see a subscapular fossa here. Because if this was sitting on the back, on the left side of the body, or in this case, actually, sorry, the right side of the body, I think I said that it was a... Sorry, yeah, it is a left. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that uh, on the left side of the body, I forgot I'm looking at the back here. On the left side of the body, then you're going to notice uh, that uh, this guy here would be below it. It would be deep. This would be deep. So this is the subscapular fossa because it's going to be deep or underneath the scapula when in anatomical position, when in situ. Now, uh, what I want to do here, guys, is now turn our attentions to our humerus. Uh, humerus is going to have a lot of things to look at. Now, let me real quick get our humerus under the camera here. Um, this will be something kind of new. I've There we go. I was going to make sure the whole thing fits. Uh, I am concerned about how some of the models will work with this. Uh, some new equipment I've gotten from the college to help me make some videos for my online classes. Now, we're going to start with the head of the humerus. The head of the humerus is a uh, is what's going to articulate uh, with the glenoid fossa. Then we're going to look at our anatomical neck, our greater and lesser tubercles, our intertubicular groove, the shaft, also called a diaphysis, the deltoid tuberosity, the two condyles, the capitulum and the trochlea, the medial and lateral epicondyle, the olecranon and coronoid fossa, and radial fossa. Let's begin with the head, the most easy thing to find. The head will be found on the proximal end of this long bone, proximal end. This is the proximal end. This is the distal end. We are looking at an anterior surface of this bone. And on the medial side of this bone here, on its medial side, we will find the head of the humerus, the uh, part of the humerus that articulates with the acromia, I mean with the uh, glenoid fossa here, and the fact that the this is lateral on the scapula means this is medial on the humerus. Now, so the head. Now, next, let's turn our attentions here to the anatomical neck. Now, my model does not have a very good anatomical neck. Actually, not quite visible at all. The anatomical neck is basically the growth plate one would find right about here. My model is not going to depict that incredibly well, barely visible and marketable here, uh, though there are models that have it, uh, we have no one model that shows everything, so I use a variety of models when I teach, but I am limited on what I'm allowed to bring home with me during COVID. Um, so, all right, so I did pick uh, certain things for a reason. Now, we also want to find our greater and lesser tubercle than the intertubicular groove. The greater tubercle is going to be, so here if we have our head, which is uh, medial, we want to go to the opposite side lateral and find the greater tubercle. Greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, intertubicular groove. Greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, intertubicular groove. 
Greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, intertubicular groove. Greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, intertubicular groove. So the greater tubercle is more lateral. The lesser tubercle is a little bit more medial. And between the two is the intertubicular groove. Also called the bicipital groove because the biceps tendon passes through that anatomically. All right, the shaft is pretty obvious on this bone. It is the long part found between the two ends, also called a diaphysis, referred to as the shaft. Now, on the shaft, on its more proximal part, we're going to find the deltoid tuberosity. To find the deltoid tuberosity, just come down from the greater tubercle, and right here you will find it. The deltoid tuberosity, the raised rough area found right here, just below your greater tubercle, is the deltoid tuberosity. Raised and rough where the deltoid muscle attaches. All right, now we want to turn our attention to the condyles. Now, these condyles will be found on the distal end of the bone and uh, the capitulum and the trochlea. Now, they're going to be found on the distal end of this bone. So what I'm going to do here is zoom in a little bit. Now, you could tell this one's been used a lot in the classroom. People have touched it with pins. Now, right here, we will find the trochlea. Trochlea is a word that means pulley. This is our trochlea ending here. Trochlea, the pulley. Next to that is the capitulum. Now, this is the medial side, actually, because I've had to flip it around because this is the medial epicondyle, so we are looking medial. So the more medial of the uh, different um, uh, condyles is the trochlea. And then over here is our capitulum, more lateral, right next to the lateral epicondyle. And I'm going to talk about these epicondyles again. Now, the medial lateral epicondyle, the medial epicondyle will be the very large one. Now, to help you guys out with that, let's zoom out. Let's help orient ourselves and help you find out why it is that. We should know that the head will be medial because it's going to be facing towards the body's midline to articulate with the head of the uh uh, that, so that the head can articulate with the glenoid fossa, making this on the same surface here medial. This is the medial epicondyle, which means this is the lateral epicondyle on that end. So if I turn it around here and I zoom in on this, and I move my mouse, I am going to see your trochlea next to the medial epicondyle, the capitulum here next to the lateral epicondyle. <clears throat> All right. And then what I want to do is talk about the olecranon and coronoid fossas and radial fossa. Now, the olecranon fossa we're going to talk about first. Now, to find the olecranon fossa, I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to turn this bone like this. We're looking at its anterior surface. We're going to go and turn it. And I like to say like olecranon, very deep, because this is the deep fossa found on the distal end, posterior surface. The olecranon fossa will allow the process of the ulna called the olecranon process to fit into it. So this is the deep olecranon fossa, very deep. So say it deeply, olecranon, because it's the deep fossa. And then the next one that we're going to see is the coronoid and radial fossa. Now, why is it called the coronoid fossa? Well, let me again show you. Here, I have a coronoid process. And the trochlea will articulate, and when you flex the arm, the coronoid process needs a place to recess into. And that place that it recesses into here is called the coronoid fossa. Coronoid fossa is found in, uh, here just above, actually, directly superior to, though I'm upside down, this is the distal end, so this is actually just above it, 
uh, of your trochlea, and you will find the coronoid fossa. Now, the other one is called the radial fossa because the head of the radius articulates here, and when it goes into flexion, it will uh, recess into this little pit, and this is the radial fossa just above your capitulum. Now, in anatomy, one of the things I always tell my students to do is to learn to relate structures to other things they learn, okay? Now, really, though, we don't have a lot left to do, uh, but it is a lot of things, but I'm wanting to show you everything, uh, and it will be photographs of the models that I'm using, or at least those uh, that we have in our labs that's, that I've got posted on D2L, those uh, label models that I'm using for your test, kind of like how I did your histo exam. Um, now, the ulna, we're going to begin with the ulna. Now, the radius and ulna, I'm going to have these kind of out together. I'm going to start with the ulna. The ulna, to me, looks like an ice cream scooper. So when you look at it, I want you guys to be thinking it looks like an ice cream scoop. And so here's our ice cream scooper here, the ulna. Then the radius that we're going to see with it as well, the radius and the ulna. Now, we are going to begin with the ulna because that is what our... Uh, structure sheets do, we're going to find the olecranon, coracoid, and trochlear notch. Now, the trochlear notch, also called semilunar notch, this is actually something I'm going to use to start with, and I'll come back to it in order. But I want you guys to look at this. Notice this looks like a half moon. Semilunar means half moon. Now, the olecranon is on top of the moon here. Olecranon is on top of the moon. Coronoid, he's kind of down here. He cowers under the moon. The coronoid is going to be found at the bottom, but the on top of the moon is the olecranon. And so the olecranon process on top, the coronoid process here with a semilunar notch or trochlear notch because it also it's called the trochlear notch because it articulates with the trochlea of the humerus all right <clears throat> cool beans cool beans all right now our uh, uh, radial notch this is something I'm going to use to help you understand what it is. This is on the proximal end right here, and you will see a notch right here. That's because the proximal end of the radius has the radial head that articulates into this, hence forming the radial notch of the ulna. Radial notch of the ulna because the head of the radius articulates there. Now, next, we're also going to see a styloid process. Very easy to find the styloid process. We want to turn our attentions to the distal end. So we were at the proximal end. We're going to turn our head. At, uh, the ulna gets is bigger at the proximal end, gets skinnier at the distal end. And at the distal end here, there is a little stick-like structure here called the styloid process. Now, the other end of this is the head. The head of the ulna here and the styloid process of the ulna. So, what I want to do is talk about that in just a minute. We're going to be talking about our radius in a minute and then our hand bones. Now, when it comes to all of these structures, let's talk about the head, radial tuberosity, styloid processes, and ulnar notch. Now, the head of the radius, let's zoom back out, and we know that the head of the radius actually articulates with the ulnar notch, I mean, the radial notch of the ulna, and also articulates with the capitulum of the humerus. So the head of the radius is the round roller found on the proximal end of the radius. Next structure we're going to turn our attention to is the radial tuberosity. 
radio a tuberosity is a raised rough patch and right here we have a raised rough patch for muscles to attach this is actually the point of attachment for the biceps on the forearm is the radial tuberosity now the styloid process of the radius is found on the distal end not as sharp as the ulnas was now, notice that the ulna not only has a styloid process and the radius does, but also does the temporal bone. This is why I do want you guys to tell me things like styloid process of the blank bone. Because um, if you just say styloid process, I'm going to be like, which one? Now, the ulnar notch is called that because the distal end, the head of the ulna, articulates there. And we have on this end what is called the ulnar notch of the radius, right here. Ulnar notch of the radius, okay? All right. Let's turn our attentions now to the hand. Now, the hand has a lot going on. We're going to start with the carpal bones. Then we're going to look at the metacarpals and the phalanges. And then most phalanges, uh, we'll see now the carpal bones. There's a, a mnemonic I like to give. There are couples, but I'm going to give this one. Is so long to pinky, here comes the thumb. So long to pinky, here comes the thumb. Trapezium is under the thumb. So long to pinky, here comes a thumb. Now, this is going to help us get the proximal and distal rows of the carpal bones down. So I'm going to start off with a hand here. And this hand model here that we have, uh, let's talk about the different regions of the hand. That there are carpal bones, metacarpals, and phalanges. Now, just real quick, the carpal bones, that's the wrist. Carpal bones have um, one two, three, four bones on what we call the proximal row, and then one, two, three, four bones on the distal row. Attached to the carpals are the bones here, 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 and here, five, called metacarpals, because they met the carpals here. Then we have the finger bones here, called the phalanges and we're going to get into the phalanges some have three some have two depending on if you're digit number one or digits number two three four or five now as we turn our attentions here to the carpal bones i'm going to zoom in and the mnemonic that i used to help us remember them was uh to kind of and i'm going to zoom in and out is so long to pinky Okay, so let's start so long to pinky. So long to, turn it, pinky. Now, let's zoom out. This is our pinky finger. So, so long to, so long to pinky. On the far side where the pinky is, okay? So long to pinky. Let's zoom in and let's talk about these. So, that is scaphoid, the scaphoid. So long. That is lunate. Two, triquitrium. Pinky, pisiform. Scaphoid, lunate, triquitrium, and then pisiform. Scaphoid, lunate, triquitrium, and pisiform. So long to pinky. Now the distal row, here comes the thumb. And here we are under the thumb. Trapezium is under the thumb. So scaphoid, lunate, triquidrium, pisiform. Now, uh, so, so long to pinky. Here. Hamate. Now, if you look on the palmar surface of the hamate, you will see it has a hook. The hook of hamate. It's a good way of checking yourself when you're studying. 
is the hook of hamate. So the hamate. So long to pinky. Here comes. In the middle of the wrist is the capital. The capitate. So, so long to pinky. Pinky. Here comes the. Tra uh, this is the trapezoid. And then the trapezium is on the thumb. Scaphoid, lunate, triquidrium, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate is how I learned it, but I'm using so long to pinky. Here comes the thumb. Trapezium is under the thumb. So scaphoid, lunate, triquidrium, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Now, these bones, as I said, are called the metacarpals. But then the fingers are your phalanges. Notice that there's 14, but now look here. There's 14. Now, there's 10 fingers. Uh, there's five fingers here, okay, five fingers. And that should be 15, shouldn't it? Because there's three bones for each finger. Well, that's not because here you are one short. The digit one, first digit, thumb, only has two bones. So it only has a proximal and a distal phalanx. Whereas digit two, three, four, and five, the pinky, the pinky's digit number five, we call it digit equinty. The thumb is digit number one called the pollux has a proximal, middle, and distal phalanx associated to it, okay? So that is why instead of 15, that there are 14 per hand, okay? And uh, so I hope my mnemonics do help. I have some more. We will pick off with the lower extremities all by themselves in the next lab. Uh, the thing is, so what you want to do is take my models labeled and practice those. I always recommend you take post-it notes and cover up the answers. Quiz yourself. Get, now, if you are not writing your answers down somewhere, you're not practicing because you're going to have to type the answers out for the practical through D2L, uh, through Brightspace uh, to take your quiz, just like how you did your, uh, your, your test that we did before. Now, this one will be... Um, I am considering, and I'm going to go ahead and just say 40 and 20. Uh, I mean, sorry, 40 and 10. I apologize. This one will be different. In AMP, my first two exams, I always follow a different pattern because of the necessity of the material. This one will be 40 identifications and 10 multiple choice. Now, the rest of them will always be 30, 20. That you take, if you ever have me for MP1 and 2, both, you will always have from here on out, after the bones, 30-20. But this one is going to be 40-10, okay? Guys, this does conclude my video on uh, this uh, second part. Uh, uh, go ahead, and I hope you guys are looking forward to seeing the last one. The bones is one of the toughest things you do. So please, I hope you're preparing and getting yourself ready. You had a great start um, with that first lab exam, and I really hope... The next one is even better. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, please don't hesitate to email me if you got any questions, need anything. Come see me on my office hours. I'm always glad to help. Thank you, guys. Have a great day.